And so we thank you for giving us Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for coming. Thank you for making a way where there was no way. Thank you for your obedience. We thank you just how amazing you are that you would leave your throne and come and, and uh, be fully man and fully God. And while you're on the earth, choose to set aside your, your God Yes, while you were fully God, you only operated as a man, as a son of man. Even so much, the word says that, that you, we have a high priest that can sympathize with all of our weaknesses because you understand, because you lived in humanity, what we call the incarnation. Father, I, I thank you that Jesus was faithful, that he, that, uh, he demonstrated the Christian life for us, what it's supposed to be like, and then he gave himself for us. He went to the cross, was crucified for us, he atoned for us, and he conquered death and hell, disease, sickness, and then he rose again on the third day and on the 40th day, he ascended back up to his throne where all power, all authority is given to him in heaven and earth. Jesus and Father, we thank you for the second amazing gift that you gave to us, and that was the promise of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that just as you gave Jesus the Holy Spirit when he was fully man to operate under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, that everything that he did was by the Holy Spirit. You gave that same Spirit to us. That we could be filled with the Holy Spirit. And just as and Jesus said that, that as the Father has sent me, I send you. And that all the things that I did, all the miracles, everything that I did, you will do also. But even greater than what I did. And so we thank you for the Holy Spirit and his visitation on the earth, his visitation to us. And so Holy Spirit, tonight you already come, but we extend the red carpet to you. We extend a welcome to you and we say you're welcome in this place. You're welcome in our lives. We give you, we give you preeminence in all things. We love your gifts. We love your anointing. We love your, the fruit that comes from having it. Lord, we thank you that you are the anointer. You're the one that gives revelation and understanding and insight. But you're also the teacher. And so, Lord, just as you've led us, Holy Spirit, you've led us into worship this evening, will you lead us into your word? And would you, would you teach us some things from your word? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The, um, in preparing it for tonight, the, one of the verses the Lord spoke to me, and I believe this is a word to you, and it's out of 1 Corinthians 12.1. It's not up on the screen. But it says this, it says, Paul writes, writing to the Corinthians, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. And if you have a, if you look at it in your Bible, not all Bibles do this, but if you have a Bible that, that uh, uh, highlights what's in the, the original manuscripts and what's not, if you look at this verse, you'll see when it comes to gifts, that it's italicized. It's kind of turned at an angle. The reason why it is italicized is because it wasn't in the original uh, language. It wasn't in the original writings of the scripture. Now the, the, the um, um, uh, interpreters, the Bible interpreters, when they read that, they made an assumption that later, right after this, Paul talks about spiritual gifts, and he lays out spiritual gifts. And so they made an assumption that, uh, that when he said, 
Now concerning the spirituals, what the, what the original text says, that he was talking about spiritual gifts because he talks about it later. So they put that word in their gifts so it wouldn't be confusing to, to us. But the word is really not in there. I, it's, it's really not in the original text. And I believe, this is my conviction, that Paul was saying, now, brethren, you all, uh, now concerning the spirituals, the spiritual realm, I do not want you to be aware, unaware, of the spiritual realm, how it works, how it operates. And then he went in and, and he taught about spiritual gifts. But spiritual gifts was only one portion of the spirituals. Is that making sense? You guys tracking with me? Yeah, okay. And so the, there's, there's much, much more than spiritual gifts. And I think sometimes in, in our churches, especially in charismatic churches and Pentecostal churches, that we focus too much on the spiritual gifts. Um, I believe that when we're filled with the Spirit, when, we, when we're walking with God, the gifts will manifest. And even, even some of my, my brothers that are in more conservative churches, evangelical churches, churches that don't have a, a, a theology for the gifts today, if they really love God and, and they're seeking Him, the gifts will manifest in them. Because they're from God. Right? Maybe they won't fully operate and understand how they operate or acknowledge them, but they will work. A number of years ago, I was at, at a... Um, at a church um, doing a, a memorial for one of my uh, one of my cousin's children sorry about that and, uh, and they were part of a Baptist church a, a really um, community Baptist church, a great church that lifts up the word of God but they don't, they didn't have um, a theology for um, um, spiritual gifts or even even that God would speak today they would say that you know God just speaks through his word that there is no other revelation other than his word I don't, I don't agree with you with that but that's that's their doctrine that's their theology it doesn't mean that they're not good Christians it doesn't mean that God doesn't still speak to them when they read the word that he speaks to them because that's one of the ways he speaks uh, to us right you follow me yeah. Any of you from Baptist uh, evangelical backgrounds? I love I love them because there's a there's a, a, a foundation in the word that oftentimes in charismatic churches and Pentecostal churches that we don't. We we flow with the things of the spirit and we don't study the word and get the grounding of the word. Well anyways, um, he uh, he was going to pray, and then I had a few words, and I was, and then I, and then I was going to pray. That's how my cousin set it up. And when he prayed, he prayed the most powerful um, uh, prayer, and it was so appropriate to all the circumstances. My cousin's daughter was a student at USC. She was in Mexico. She was studying abroad in Mexico City. She had finished her studies. She was coming back home, was going to graduate from USC with honors within in two weeks. And on, on their way driving back, a car went, a truck went over the wrong side of the road and head in and she was instantly killed. So it was a, it was a tough, it was a tough situation. This young girl was a brilliant and, and was looking forward to, you know, starting her career and stuff. But when he prayed, the prayer was so tender. It was. It touched every part of it, and and I was, you know, I, you could just sense the presence of God on it. And so afterwards, I went up to him and I just said, "Hey, how did you learn how to pray like that?" And he said, "I don't know." I said, "Oh, well, I said, man, that was amazing prayer. It was so, so much details, details that he didn't know about my cousin and." and and his daughter and, and stuff. And, I said, and he goes, I said, well, when you pray, what do you do? And he says, you know, I just close my eyes. And oftentimes I see pictures. And I just pray the pictures that I'm seeing in my mind's eye. You know, 
And I said, so you hear, you hear God or you see God? Oh, no, no, I, you, know, you can't do that. <laughs> right? But that's what I do. Right? I said, okay, I didn't, I didn't want to get into a theological debate or anything with him. I said, well, I just bless you. That was awesome. Can keep doing that. But it, but it opened the key to me to understand the presence of God. Is that, that God, uh, he wants to speak to us. He wants to reveal himself. And, and he wants to make himself available for us. What I want to do is I want to just talk... Um, a little bit of the first part of my notes, and I'm going to skip to the middle of my notes, and then I'm going to go to the end, and we're going to do an activation. Um, I think you guys have it up, the, the first part. If you just raise that first paragraph up to the top where we can see it, that would be great. So the narrative of Scripture begins and ends with the presence of God. Beginning in the book of Genesis, we see the presence of God in the formation of the earth. You're all familiar with it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And we see the Spirit of God hovering over. That word in the original Hebrew is he's like vibrating. There's like a vibration that's, that's going. We know by science now that light is vibration. And there's this like vibration and it's, it's created. And then we see Eden was the first couple's home. But more importantly, it was God's sanctuary. It was God's garden. It was his garden temple where he dwelled, where the creator and his image bearers, people, Adam and Eve, uh, were there. It was, it was a temple on earth. It was heaven on earth. It was a, it was a colony of heaven on the earth. And they were given a commission to what? Be fruitful and multiply. That wasn't just have children. That was to take the garden and expand it around the earth. To expand the presence of God, the colony, if you would, of God. And they, and they conversed with God. They had a relationship with God. You skip up to the, the uh, paragraph that says at the end of the book of Revelation. So at the end of the book of Revelation, we see Eden has returned and expanded into a new heaven and a new earth where all of God's people enjoy his presence eternally, forever and ever. So it, it's when he comes to establish his, his throne on the earth, he establishes kingdom on the earth. Now the, the dictionary defines presence as this, the state of being present or current existence also means the immediate proximity of someone or something. Also means dignified manner or conduct. Example that was in the, in the dictionary, the online dictionary looked at it says, presence is a state of being somewhere. And when you get an invitation that reads, your presence is requested, you are being asked to show up. And your, and your style of being there, your demeanor or, bear, of, or bearing is also your presence. Right? So worship, like we had worship earlier, what we were doing is we were welcoming and inviting God's presence to come. We were creating an atmosphere that, that he would dwell. In other places in scripture, David says that you would be, that I would create a footstool for you. That his feet would rest here. We're creating a place for that. And we do that in our worship. One of the songs that we, we uh saying this even, it says, when your presence comes, right, things happen, things move. And so there's, there is, um,
There's a, there's a couple, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. There's a couple other words that, that speak about presence in the, in the Hebrew. I'm not going to even try to pronounce that word. But the word means face, faces, presence, person. Literally, it means face to face. The word presence in the Old Testament means face. Being in, in the face. It also has the meaning like the face of the earth. So it's, a, it's the face of the earth or the face of a wall. So Genesis 3.8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence or the face of the Lord. In the original Hebrew, the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So Adam and Eve were face to face. We see, in, we see with, with Abraham. Abraham was face to face with God. He had conversations with God. Now, it, it, uh, many, many theologians would say that that was pre-incarnate Jesus, or uh, epiphany, or a Christology. There's different terms for that, but it was, it was Jesus appearing in the New Testament before the incarnation or in the Old Testament before he appeared in the New Testament. Now, people debate on that. I'll, I'll let you there. Some people say it was an angel representing, but we see Moses has face-to-face -face encounter. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of Christians misunderstand that because it, when, when uh, Moses said, let me see your presence, let me see your glory, he was asking, let me see all of you. And God said that you can't see, you can't see all of my glory or it would kill you. Right? And so he hit him in the cliff of the rock and he passed by. And so Moses just sees the, 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 his glory, or, or the word actually uses the word goodness, as it passes him by. So a lot of Christians will say, you know, and theologians will say, well, you can't see God. If you see God, then, then uh, you'll, it, you'll die. That you can't stand it. Well, that was, he was asking for all of his presence, the manifest presence of everything. It doesn't mean that he, we don't encounter God. Matter of fact, all of Scripture is, is really about the presence of God. And the, it, it's God touching earth. You know, Leonardo's Da Vinci, uh, da Vinci um, his painting of, of the fingers touching each other, you guys have seen that? Yeah, so a lot of people just put that part on there, but if you take the part, is that he has a picture of, of God reaching down and touching man, right? A lot of people just zoom in on that because Leonardo da Vinci didn't believe in clothes. <laughs> right? But what Leonardo da Vinci was talking about was is heaven touching earth. And that's, that is the narrative of all of Scripture. All of Scripture is story after story after story of, of man and woman, when I say man, I'm including them, encountering God, having relationship, having encounters with God. We were created to have encounters with God. We were created to have fellowship with Him. If you um, skip up to the, the headline, it says, God is immanent because of His transcendent. He is transcendent. I know this is a little theological for some of you, but I, I think it will, will, will help you. I think sometimes we, we experience things, but God wants us a foundation. He wants us to build on a foundation of His Word. When we build on the foundation of His Word, then it makes more sense. But it says, the Lord God in the heavens above is transcendent, and on the earth beneath, immanent. But to understand God in full, we must recognize that His drawing near to creation stems from His being distinct from creation. In other words, there is no deficiency in God that creation satisfies. 
He doesn't need us. He doesn't have to. He desires us, but he doesn't. Scripture emphasizes God's manifest presence, not only his omnipresence. There is a difference between saying God is everywhere and saying God is here. The former is a default category for most Christians. We talk about God's presence being inescapable and that he is, is everywhere present. Um, one one, uh, one uh, Bible teacher says it this way. It says there's truth and then there's greater truth. So, so God is present everywhere, but there is a place where his presence is even more. Just like, it's, like, just like uh, James, it says that, that uh, one person can pray and there's effect for one person to pray. But then he says when two or more are gathered, they have what they have. So both are true, but, but there's a greater reality when two or three gather. And so there's a, there's a reality of God's presence. He holds everything together. There's nowhere you could go where you won't experience his presence. But there's a manifest presence that, that is different. It's when he breaks into our circumstances, into our life, into the world. It says, however, Scripture seems more concerned with his presence manifest in relationship and redemption. And though these divine realities are certainly not at odds, the biblical narrative does turn on, the, on God's being manifest with his people in Eden, the tabernacle, the temple, the incarnation of Christ, the ecclesia. Ecclesia is the word in the Greek that used for church, that we use for church. And that's a whole teaching on its own on what the word ecclesia means. And, and the word that, that um, translators use uh, for church, starting with the King James Version. Another, another time, another teaching. And the new heaven and the new earth. So the whole narrative of Scripture from the beginning to end, God's history is Him wanting to commission, wanting to be present, wanting us to experience His presence. Let's skip up to the, where it says God's presence and humanity's mission are inescapable. As we become faithful in learning how to host the presence, and that's what we were doing earlier. That's what the band was doing here. That's what a worship team is supposed to do. It, it's, it, they, they, uh, they lead us into God's presence. Now they need to spend time in, in God's presence and and cultivate that on their own. But when they come, when we come together, the reason why we worship and the things that we do is that we are hosting. Now, just, just if, if I was going to come over to your house, you know, and maybe you invited me over to dinner or something, you would, you would prepare your, your house, you would prepare a meal or whatever you were going to do. You'd probably vacuum and clean whatever you would do. Maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But you would get ready to host me. And if you were a good host, when I showed up, you would pay attention to me, right? You wouldn't open the door and say, come on in, sit down, and then go do your own stuff, right? <laughs> and just leave me sitting there. When, when I showed up, you would, you would talk with me. You would, you would offer me something to drink. You would maybe offer me something to eat, right? Because you invited me over to do something. Sometimes we do worship and we don't realize or worship or other things. There's a, a list I'll show you in a minute of things that, that attracts God's presence. Is sometimes we, we, we invite him and he shows up and then we like, you know, oh, it's, it's almost lunchtime or, you know, <laughs> what am I going to do, you know? And, and we, we leave and he's there like, I'm here, I'm here. Engage with me, talk to me, do something. I showed up, you invited me here. What are you going to do? I, I love the word tonight. I love the, the response of the worship team. When the word was, we're not done yet. And they continued. Sometimes, 
because because of of our structure and and those things sometimes it's like okay we're going to do three worship songs we're going to do the announcements we're going to do the word we're going to pray we're going to go home we're going to you know do do whatever and sometimes god shows up and he says that's good most of the time but today i just i like to hang out with you a little bit messes everything up <laughs> James told me like a week or two, a week or two, it messed up, man. The Sunday school teachers, man, they've got, they've got a stew on the pot, you know. <laughs> these, these kids, man, they're like pulling my hair out. <laughs> my wife works at Edwanda High School, and, uh, and she works in a special needs area, and, and one of the gals she works with, um, she uh, was... Um, I forget what it's called, but she, she's an aide and she was working in this classroom and the classroom was just totally out of control. And she, this gal comes back to the offices where my wife works and she, she started telling them it was totally out of control and she's just like, I'm pulling my hair out. And she had like a false hair piece or something. She pulls out and says, pull my hair out. Everybody in the office is like, ah! <laughs> As we become faithful in learning how to host the presence of the Lord, is it important to understand that there is a tension? Guys felt the tension? Between the two realities. He has been given to us without measure, yet what we enjoy on a daily basis has been measured. To us according to our faithfulness. In other words, we have access to the unlimited measure of God's presence. But he doesn't entrust himself to untrustworthy people. All of the measurements that we have set up on our end of the equation, he typically entrusts us with the measure of the presence that we are willing to jealously guard. That's Bill Johnson. And so, same as this next paragraph. That comes from his book, Hosting the Presence. It's an excellent book to read. Wow. We are to become his resting place, the place from which the exploits of heaven are accomplished. For when the Lord rests upon a person, there is actually an atmospheric shift. We sing that, right? Do you believe what you sing? Do you believe the words when we're singing those? Or are they just a, are they just a nice song? Yeah. I believe them. I believe, I have a friend who is an intercessor and she, ha and she raises up teams of intercessor and they go all around the world and they go to, to assignments that God gives them and they pray. And so for a number of years they've been going to Spain and in Spain there, there is some like, there is a corrupt leader there and there was an altar to Satan and where that they even buried a, a body there uh, and 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 um, occultish people would go there and worship in there, and it's it's a source. It has effect over all of Europe, and they've been going there for several years. And when they go there, they pray, they worship, and they declare God's goodness. And they and she's been doing it faithfully, going going there and doing it. Uh, about two years ago, they went, and there's, it's a cave where this, all this stuff is. They went, and uh, people are going in there, and they were praying, and they heard a noise, and this cave cracked. There was no earthquake or anything. It just cracked. And, and because the, the officials, after they left, they saw it, and they saw the crack after they left, the officials found out about it, and they had to close it because it was no longer geographic, geo, whatever, safe. Right. This last, uh, just a few months ago, this last summer, they went back again, and the government decided to go in and take this body out and dispose of it, just to, to unassemble it. And this corrupt leader that was in Spain that they had been praying over uh, was kicked out of the office. Prayer, worship. The presence of God changes things.
Bill Johnson writes here, he says, how do we think uh, Peter's shadow healed people? Our shadow will always release whatever overshadows us. When we learn to host the presence of the Lord, we get more breakthroughs by accident than we used to, ha uh, used to happen on purpose. This is possibly for every believer every day. Skip up to the verse where it's Exodus uh, 25, 8. God says to, God says to, uh, to Moses, he says, Let them construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell with them. His desire, and this was uh, Moses' uh, tabernacle. God desires to dwell with us. God wants to establish his presence with us. He asked us to prepare a place. So Moses' tabernacle was a visible presence. Uh, or or when, he, when he built the, the tabernacle, let me put it this way, when he built the tabernacle, God's visible presence came. And it's, it talks about in Exodus, I have the verse there. It says, then, they're finished, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So he, he created a place for God's presence with his permission. And when he did, the tangible presence of the Lord came and everybody saw it. By the way, the word glory in the original Hebrew has several different meanings, but one of the meanings of it is, is opinion. So, so when you see glory, it's God's opinion. Christ in you is his opinion over your opinion. Then we see, we see David's tabernacle. And when David's tabernacle is done, the manifest presence comes. A little bit different, but at the tabernacle of David, David, King David now had full free access to God's presence. Further, there was no veil separating people from the Ark of the Covenant. And there was in Moses' tabernacle, it's a... a it's an interesting um, thing, but some theologians believe this. I, I do, I believe in them. And just a little background in, in David and wh why David's tabernacle was different than Moses' tabernacle is it's most likely that David was the, it was an illegitimate son of Jesse. So when, when uh, Samuel comes and asks Jesse to bring all of his sons, he brings all of his sons, and, and we know the story, you know, he goes down through each one, and none of them were, and he asked, do you have another son? And he said, and then they said, David, who's out tending the sheep, and it's, uh, uh, some translations translate that the youngest, but it, actually the Hebrew is the least, and we look at, we look at the, the genealogy, other places, David actually had a, a brother younger than him. He wasn't the youngest brother. So, so many theologians believe when David said, uh, uh, I was brought forth from my mother's womb in sin, is that, that he was an illegitimate son. It might have been a contrabine, it could have been something else, but... But that he uh, uh, was illegitimate, and that's why he was an outcast from his other brothers, but in the household. And so if you tear, take that narrative for, forward, when David becomes king, right, and they, and they recapture the, the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines, they, they capture it back, he doesn't set up the... the, the Moses tabernacle um, because it was called the, the tent of meeting and, it, and the Old Testament had, had rules about the tent of, of meeting and if you weren't a legitimate son 
So you weren't legitimately born. You weren't born outside of marriage. You were not allowed to go in there. And so David sets up his tabernacle. He brings it from the place that it was supposed to be to Jerusalem, and he sets it up. And when he sets it up, it's not set up under the, the, the Old Testament law of the place of meeting place. And so we see in David's tabernacle that everyone could come before God's presence. There was no holy of holies or holy the holy or the holy holies. There was no inner uh, marks there. Uh, uh, they made sacrifices of praise instead of animal sacrifices. His tabernacle, there was no animal sacrifices. They clapped, their, they clapped their hands. They lifted up their hands in worship. They shouted. They danced. They sought the Lord. They played their instruments. David raised up 4,000 musicians that were the top, top musicians. If you think of the top musicians today in the world, that's who he had. And they had to be trained as the, as, as the Levites. So they, need, they needed to know the first five books of the Bible they had to memorize all of them. They had to be experts in the word, and they had to be experts in their, in their musicianship. And they, and they uh, led worship 24-7, nonstop, for 33 years. How long did Jesus live? So if you... If you even today, if you go to Israel, they'll tell you the golden years of Israel was under King David. So King David is so tied, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, to Jesus. So the tabernacle of David was a, was a symbol or a foreshadow of the church. In the book of Hebrews, we are told to come boldly into the throne room of God and because of the redeeming work of Jesus, we have full access to God's presence, just like they did in the tabernacle of David. When the tabernacle was established, it was, it was called Zion. So you don't see in the, in the Old Testament, you don't see the word Zion until David sets up his tabernacle. The word Zion literally means God's presence or God's dwelling place. So anytime you read in the Psalms, you say, you know, going up to Zion, it was, it was literally going up to God's presence, going up to where he dwells. So the tabernacle, um, uh, or Zion is, is a, a heavenly sanctuary. It is the highest heaven where all creation worships the king. And Zion on earth is, is like an assembly. And God gives promises about Zion. And so you can take wherever it says Zion, you can put presence. And from Zion, we see God's blessing is released. Zion is God's revelation is made known. God's, uh, Zion is God's authority is established. Zion is the place of refuge and protection. God is the place of, uh, Zion is the place of, of healing and forgiveness. Zion ex uh, experiences abundant provision. Zion is a place of unrestrained joy. So, when, when uh, Israel went into captivity, and, and uh, the, the temple was destroyed, when the Babylonians came and they took all the instruments out, and we see in the minor prophets, we see later, uh, after 70 years, they go back in and they rebuild the tabernacle and they reestablish the tabernacle. But we, we don't see anywhere in, in that where God's Spirit habitated the tabernacle after they went in captivity. They established it, but we don't see the presence come. When, when, when you know, Moses did his tabernacle, we see the presence of God coming when we see uh, uh, Solomon's temple after David, after David passed, Solomon builds a temple. David, uh, you know, set Solomon up with everything he needed to do it. When they dedicate it, we see the presence of God coming. In a, in a, in a, in Haggai, it says that the 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 uh, uh, the glory of the of the former was never there. The glory didn't come back in. 
But what we see is that there is a promise for a tabernacle or a temple that wouldn't be made with hands. Anybody know who that is? What that it is? That's us. Individually and corporately, that we are stone upon stone together. We're the tabernacle. So what happens on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit comes and fills. The glory of the Lord fills. The manifest presence. So as Christians, we should experience the manifest presence because we are the tabernacle. We are the, now the dwelling place of the Lord. Does that make sense? Um, I'm just going to touch on this, is that there are, in Scripture there are a number of things that, that, that pleases God, that, that invites His presence to come. Um, I one, well, uh, one day I was sitting and the Lord just started speaking about that, and so I started writing, it, writing them down, and I got to about 44 of them, and I stopped. It's just like he, he, he kept giving me, and there's more in there, but I'm just going to highlight them real fast because, and, and I want this to be an encouragement because many of these things you're doing as a body. You're doing them here at Summit. You're doing them. But sometimes we do stuff and, we, and, and, and we're doing it in a shadow and we don't see the reality behind it. Or we do something and we don't know why we're doing it. And, and when we know why we're doing it, it brings the fullness. Just like tonight when we were leading worship, even right now when we're declaring God's word, it's inviting his presence to this community. You're shifting the community by your worship. You're shifting the community by your declaring who God is through the songs of what we sing. Do you believe that? Yeah. Uh, uh, a, a few years back, I was in, in Brazil, and we were in a, a city, um, Belo Horizonte, and in Belo Horizonte, one of the largest churches at that time in Brazil um, existed there. And we, um, I was there with a team, and we got invited to come into the church and do some training, and, and to do some ministry, and... and, and uh, uh, different things there. And so when we were there, we met some of their intercessors, and their intercessors told us that they had prayer towers. And they asked, would you like to go see the prayer tower? And we said, yeah, you know, I, said, I would love to see it. So they took us up to this prayer tower, and only an intercessor could, could go in there. You had to go through training, be approved, and go in there. But we got an invitation as guests to go up. So we go up this up this tower, and this tower is higher than the church, and you can see, you know, 360 around. And up there, there are, are like scriptures and different things, and there's intercessors 24-7. I don't know how many years they've been doing it or anything, but they're praying. And when you, when you walked up in there, you literally felt like you transcended into something different. You felt the atmosphere shift. And so we went up and we prayed, and it was like, Powerful. We were weeping, crying. People were on the ground. I mean, it was it was it was amazing. And then they tell me that this church had built towers all over Brazil, and they equated to their prayer and intercession as shifting the things. And they said, "We're we're the size of we are as a church because we've prayed and we've shifted." And they said, "In in if you've you know been to Brazil." Uh, you know, like the number one, well, let me put it this way. The number one thing that our teams prayed for when people came and asked for prayer was anxiety. And because, because it is the, the spiritual atmosphere is hard. My son, uh, my son lived in Brazil for, uh, for a, a season. And, uh, <clears throat> and we, we sent him a camera and we asked him to take pictures and send us pictures. And he wasn't sending pictures. And I didn't understand. We didn't understand. You're like, we sent you a camera, like, email some pictures and stuff. And, and when his season was up there in Brazil, um, I flew down to Brazil and to help him to pack up his apartment and stuff. And, 
he had been working the whole time and he hadn't gotten around uh, Brazil at all and, and, and uh, uh, he, he uh, uh, in, in college, he was a, a Latin America major. He was a political science Latin America major, and he hadn't gotten around to see it. So I went down and helped him close it out, and then we traveled around Brazil, and I asked him, I said, you know, Daniel, why didn't you send us any pictures? He said, everybody that I've met here has been mugged. Everybody's here, their house has been broken in. And so, and he said that, you know, uh, the community where I, everybody I work with has been mugged. He goes, and they told me, don't take out the camera or you'll get mugged for it. You'll get mugged. You know, and so he didn't carry cash with him. He didn't carry valuables with him. didn't carry that. But anyways, back to the church. Uh, a, a year or so later, we went back to that same church. And so I, I got a hold of the intercessors that, that we knew. And, I, and uh, um, one particular gal that had the, had the access to it. And I said, can we go back up there can you get us access to the prayer tower and she says yeah i can get you that but would you like to go to the the worship tower and i go what's that and she says she says well under that tower in like there's like a basement and there's a worship room there and we have 24 7 worship leaders that that come in every hour upon the hour and they've been doing it for a long time and, we, and they saw that is the base for what was God was doing on the top of it which makes sense because in Israel we see the 12 tribes and when they would go to war they would send they would take Judah which was the worshipers the intercessors and the worshipers and they would put it in front of the army they would put it in front of their, their artillery. They would put it in front of their archers. They'd put it in front of their slingers. They would put it in front of the sword bearers. They would go. And so we, we ended up, they, they led a few of us to go in. So we went into the basement and it, it was like, you wouldn't know it. It had a chain link fence. I think they had to kind of pull the chain link fence open or something to get in. And we go down into it. And in, it was a round room, and around the room, there was like a shelf. And around the shelf, there were slots. And there were 24 slots. And in the 24 slots, there was a silver shield, about like this big, kind of, kind of shaped like this, with a point. Each one of the shields had an attribute of God. And, and every intercessor, every worship intercessor that came in, they would come in, and they would take that one of the shields out in, in, in order around the room and there was an altar and the altar had a slot and they put that, that, that shield in there and for their hour they would worship God through that attribute. We went in and we were, we were only there for an hour, I think it was like 50 minutes to give time to go in and out and, it, and, and like we just hit the floor, all of us that were in there. And it was like, it was like, they're t it's kind of like when you, when you have an operation or, you know, getting tooth work and they put you out and you go, okay, you, you know, you come back and you go, okay, you ready to start? You know, and they go, no, it's all done. You know, <laughs> an hour went by an hour went by and it, and it, and it seems just like seconds. So here's some of the, here's some of the, um, the things is, um, if you go up to what tracks, the, the God's presence. I, I, I cut the list down because I knew we wouldn't have time to go through all of them, but a broken and contrite spirit. Calling on his name. Your faith brings his presence. Feeding and clothing the needy. Gathering in his name, just as you guys came tonight. You are the hungry of the hungry to come out on a Sunday night with the wind blowing. <laughs> right? Why are you here? If you're hungry for God. You want more of God. Generosity. Generosity breeds generosity. You can't outgive God. And I can tell you that is the truth. Honor. Honor. Honoring God, but honoring one another brings the presence of God. Humility brings the, um, the presence of God. Hunger, I just talked about. Your hunger 
brought his presence tonight. Your hunger to be in his presence, to know more about him, to experience him. Obedience. Your offerings and sacrifices. There's a church in Texas that I, I go visit sometimes. They do a conference. They do a, a, a conference. Well, they do several, but they do this annual conference. And my wife and I went there, and there was no charge for the conference. There was no, you know, no fees you had to pay. You just had to register so they could know how many people were coming. And we had, and it was like a four-day conference. And, and when I got into the conference, I think it was the third day, I realized that they never took an offering. They never passed a plate. They never, they never said anything about an offering. And I turned to my wife, who's more familiar with the church, and I said, you know, I go, they didn't charge an entrance fee, and they haven't taken an offering. How does this church do it? And she says, well, what they believe is that when, when, when God moves, when his presence comes, when you, you get revelation or God heals you or does anything, that they make an a, a, a offering. They give an offering. And so and then I realized that all these people, during the, when, when the person was teaching, they were getting up and, and dropping something in a box in the front. Or during worship, there's just a stream of people with tears down their eyes dropping in it, is that they made an offering. And they realized that in the Old Testament, every time there was a breakthrough, every time God did something, they would build an, offer, an altar and they'd offer sacrifice. Praise and thanksgiving. Psalms 100, it says that... that uh, with thanksgiving, we enter the gates. And with praise, we enter the, the courts. Proclaiming God's name. I talked about in, in Brazil. Repentance. Speaking in tongues brings the presence of God. It's the only gift that says that it edifies yourself. All the rest of the gifts are for other people. One person said was this. Is the Holy Spirit is inside of me. For me, he's on me for you. The gifts are for you. But there's only one gift that says that, that if, you do, if you have this gift and you, you exercise it, it will edify you. It'll build you up. Our surrender. Taking care of widows and orphans. Taking communion. Taking communion brings the presence of God. It's a declaration. When you... When you take communion, you're doing a prophetic act of declaring God's presence and his, and, and his coming and the fullness of his kingdom coming. In, in uh, September, my wife read a book recently on, on communion and, and uh, we talked about it. And so we've been taking communion every morning, or sometimes we miss the morning, we do it later in the day, but mostly every morning since September 1st. We take it together, and we realize that communion is not just a personal thing that you do. Sometimes, you know, we, we, even in a, in a community, we take communion and we're fo focused on us. But, but Paul said to the Corinthians that when you take communion, you need to do it for its full worth, its full value. And he told the Corinthians, because you weren't doing that, some of you are getting sick, and some of you are even dying because you're not taking it for the full value, the full thing. So that tells me that communion is a, is a, uh, is a community thing. It's not just for us. So when we take communion, we take it for ourselves, and we take it and declare it over our sons and their, and their wives, over our grandchildren. We declare it over our friends, because communion represents the atonement, right? Right? In the atonement is the, the forgiveness of sin, but it's also the healing of sicknesses. Psalms 103.3, forget not all of, of his benefits, who forgives all of your iniquity and heals your diseases. So, um, and testimonies. Revelation 19.10 uh, says this. It says that uh, uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? 
when we give a testimony of what God has done, it prophesies over other people that God can break in. It prophesies to us. Um, earlier today, I was praying for, praying for somebody who has uh, ovarian cancer. And uh, a friend of this person put together a team to pray for this, this person, this, this woman. And she assembled a team of people that she knew that would have faith to pray for healing. And, and uh, one of the gals that she, she invited to pray over this other woman, nobody knew this, but when she got there, she said, well, it's appropriate that you ask me, you guys don't know this, but I'm a, I'm a twice survivor, a once of, a, of, a, of cervix cancer, or yes, and, and a second of an ovarian tumor. And God healed me both times. And so I have faith to pray for you, but what did it do for the person we were praying for? It raised up their faith. Raised up, it brought God's presence into her fear, into her anxiety, into her concern. And we prayed. We're believing for healing. So, what I want to do is shift right now. I want to do a little activation with you. Santosh, can you, can you come up on the keyboard and just play some background? How are you guys doing? Okay. You okay? You're kind of quiet. Kind of talk to me. Smile or something, you know? <laughs> Is this making sense to you? Yeah. Is this giving you a foundation? God's desire is to have is, is for you to experience his presence. He wants to break in. And in, in, his, in his, his presence, in his presence, everything shifts. Uh, we have different words for it. One of the words is anointing. Right? And, and the Bible says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. You know, I have, I have some friends... I have some friends that, that uh, uh, are evangelists that go around the world and they go and pray for people. And, they, and they, they, they know that it's not them. They know that it's the presence that comes. I'll give you an example that many of you uh, uh, know. Benny Hinn. Familiar with Benny Hinn? Maybe some of you like him. Some of you don't like him. Some of you may think he's a fake. I think he's real. I, I, think he's a, I think he's a real guy. I think he has a real anointing on him. Uh, that's my, my opinion. I hope it's God's glory on him. God's opinion too. But what he, he understands this. And so if you ever go to, to one of his crusades or one of his meetings or um, anything, you'll see that he will minister. He'll teach. He'll share testimonies. He'll do worship. He does old school worship. He doesn't do worship like we did here. I mean, it's like what I did when I was a kid. You know, it's really, to me, it's old school worship. But the presence of God's in it. His presence is in it. And he'll minister, and it's kind of like, okay, when are you going to pray for the sick? You know, uh, I went to one of his meetings not too long ago, because he has, he has a ministry down in, uh, uh, by Laguna, right? And so I went down there, and, uh, and it's like, he's ministering, he's ministering, it's like, he's talking, he's talking, he's talking, and it's like, come on, man, when are you going to minister? When are you going to minister? When are you going to pray for people? And then all of a sudden, I feel a shift in the room. Something shifted. And the presence of God came to heal. You could feel the atmosphere change. You could feel it. And as soon as that does, when he's ministering, as soon as he does, he starts saying, come, come. If you need healing, come, come. He said, come quickly, come quickly. Come quickly. The reason why he does that, he knows that God's, God's presence is there, but his manifest presence has come in a different way right now. And he doesn't know how long that will be. If that will be just for a few minutes, or if that will be for an hour, 
or if it will be longer. One time we were down in, in, in Nigeria, we had a team and we had a, a medical clinic and we were praying for people and so people would line up and we, would, we had teams that would pray for them before they would go through the clinic. And, and for literally for five hours, we had everybody that we prayed for was healed. We ruined the medical clinic. <laughs> But literally, there was only two people that didn't get instantly healed when we prayed for them. And both of them had forgiveness issues that they had to deal with first before God released healing on them. But they both got healed. So there's this, this place of master presence. So what I want to do is I want to do an activation for you to... to uh, Help you to be aware of his presence. Just like I started with a verse that said, Paul said, I don't want you to be unaware. I want to activate something. Now, many of you have probably already been activated, so we just want to ask for more. So why don't you just stand up right now? There's a there's a verse in the Bible that's one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites. But one of the verses that's really impacted me deeply in my own life, and it's Hebrews 5.14, it says this, But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. The way we become mature is that we practice. The way Santaj became a good worship leader and a keyboard player is that he's practiced. Athletes practice, musicians practice, doctors practice. When I grew up, I grew up in a, in a, a four-square Pentecostal church, and they used to have a saying that said, fake it until you make it. And that always didn't, it just didn't go on. There. I understand what they were saying. I, one day I was reading this verse and just meditating on it, and the Lord says, it's not fake it, it's, it's practice. It's practice. We need to practice His presence. We need to practice the gifts. We were talking, uh, the worship team, I think it was Santaj, was talking earlier. He says, like, how do you love God? You know, it's like, I want to love God more. One of, one, of my, one of my friends, Jake Hamilton, is a worship leader that goes around the world. Worship leader. One day he said this, he says, the way that you learn how to love God is you love God. You practice. You practice. This verse has like freed me up so much. So much, you know. I'm, I can go go be in a restaurant and, and a, a waiter or a waitress comes up and, and, you know, I have my senses and the Lord's like saying something about them. And I'll just say, hey, you know, I'm a Christian and I believe in, I believe in words of knowledge, I believe in prophecy. Can I practice on you? Yeah. I, ha I haven't... Only one time I had somebody turn me down, and that was because they're afraid their boss was going to fire them because if they stopped. And so, so it was like a back, back waiter. So he goes in and gets the, the regular waitress. She comes out, and we said, you know, hey, we're Christians, and we want to know if we can practice on you. And she goes, she goes, okay. He said, well, we have a word for you that you have an infinity for languages. And she said... She looks at us, she goes like, how did you know that? And you say, well, is it true? And she says, yeah. She goes, my grandma is, is German, and I and she lives in Germany. And so I, I, I just recently went to visit her, and she started teaching me German. And I love it. So I've come back, and I've bought some programs, different languages, and I'm, I'm learning different languages, and I have an infinity in it. And so one of the guys that's with me says, well, how would you like to receive a language that you don't have to learn? I said, what? Is there such a thing? And he goes, yeah, there is. There is. He says, but first you have to receive Jesus to get his gift, this gift. She goes, okay. So, so she prayed to receive Christ right there in the restaurant. And then we prayed for her to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to receive the gift of tongues. 
she didn't get it right there we don't know what happened but she was so filled up and so full all he said is like can we just practice our Christianity so I go all around all over the place practicing my Christianity it's like you know when you're you know it's not like you know when I was an athlete I used to be a wrestler or swimmer and you know we would practice 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 and then when you when you come to the meet that's when all the pressure was on right you're competing in a wrestling match or swim match you know and you're out there but when you're practicing there's no pressure you just make it safe so it says here in this verse it says that because of practice um, have their senses trained to discern good and evil God's given us five senses and and there is a mirror on our physical senses in the spiritual realm that make sense so so I, I've listed them there you can read them I put verses I put proof text on there so you know I'm not making it up but what I want to do is I, I want to take a, a, a minute and just pray for impartation that you would encounter God's presence through this. Now, you may not get all of them. You may one of them. You may get several of them. You may already have, have been experiencing it. Just put yourself in a receiving mode, however it is. I'm kind of like, I like to put my hands out. Like, well, I have open hands, but however you receive. So, Lord, we just, we just pray, come now, Lord. Bring your presence. Lord, we, we want to be your disciples. We want to be your students. And we want to practice everything that you're teaching us. And we want to practice it, Lord. And so as we practice, Lord, we ask that you would activate our spiritual senses. Lord, that you would activate the, the, the spirituals. Lord, we know when you activate the spirituals, it's gifts and fruit and all that stuff just flows in it. We don't have to be concerned about it because it will just come up. But if we practice, we will learn to discern when it's us and when it's you. So Lord, I just pray for a release right now of taste. That you would, that you would activate taste. The word says taste and see that the Lord is good. Whipped cream just piled up high with 
a sprinkling of nuts and two cherries on it. How many of you could see what I just described? Raise your hand if you could see it. What I did is I just dropped my picture into your imagination. You have a sanctified imagination that God will drop pictures in. Matter of fact, God's first language is pictures. The Hebrew language is it's from pictographs. So the first language was that God gave them pictures and they formed symbols to what those were and that became the first language. So God speaks through pictures. Just like I told you a story of that, the Baptist pastor that prayed what he saw, he, our mind in microseconds transfers the pictures we see into words and we see it. But God wants to, to be aware, to train your senses to see and to understand what he drops into your sanctified imagination. Making sense? Follow me. So put your hands on your eyes or around your eyes. Lord, we pray for an activation of your spiritual eyes, our spiritual eyes. That you would be, that you would make us seers, Lord, that you would mature us in, in, in seeing the pictures we, we see. And Lord, I, I just pray for a protection, Lord, that, that uh, you would put a, a guard over eyes, Lord, that they wouldn't see things that are not from you. They would not see things from the, from the evil, from the enemy. Even anybody in here that's been having nightmares, or we just cut that off right now in Jesus' name. That they would only see the images that you want to give them. That they would begin to see you. Lord, I believe that some of them will see angels. Some of them will see visions. Some of them will be having dreams. And Lord, and I, I pray for discernment over what they see. That they would they would they would have spiritual understanding of, of the things they do. And Lord, that the more that they practice this, the more mature they'll become in using this gift. Just like Jesus said, I can only do what I see the Father doing. That they would become like Jesus. And that they would see what the Father is doing. They would see what God is doing. So release that right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The next one is smell. God gives us spiritual sense to smell. I've been in meetings where like this perfume, like this Rose of Sharon, is like roses would come across and come things, but also the Lord has given me the discernment. I've walked into rooms and, and and I could smell evil. I could smell demons on people at times. I've walked into a building and I could smell death in that building. And I went and searched and sure enough, hidden in a drawer where the Lord led me, there was a dead rat. I've been in the hospital when I've, when I've gone to pray for people and I've walked in, I could smell the spirit of death. And when, when I smelled the spirit of death, I rebuked that spirit and kicked it out in Jesus' name and the person lived person that they had called me and said he only has hours to live but when you, when when I smell the spirit of death I go oh I know what that is God has authority over that so I release your smell right now even right now in this room that people would begin to uh, smell things they begin to smell spiritual aromas you would mature them and discern and give them discernment over those. Lord, we release touch. Lord, that you would release words of knowledge. That you would release, Lord, that they would they would release touch, that they would fill your presence when your presence comes, Lord. It might be the quivering of the of the eyelids. It might be 
holy goosebumps. It might be it, like a friend of mine. There's when when they know when the presence of God is speaking to them because they're spying birds. One of the things that God does to me when I when I'm praying for people, when I lay my hand on the shoulder and I start praying for them, if they're in anxiety, I will literally feel the anxiety come up my arm. And the further it goes up, it's like a thermometer. And they have, they, people have not given any indication that they're under extreme uh, anxiety, extreme uh, stress. And when I've prayed on them, the Lord has told me, he's told, he tells me like, how far up my arm, at what level it is. I just activate that, that you'll be in the grocery store. And maybe your, your knee, who is not hurt, you haven't done anything, your knee, your knee begins to hurt, and you start looking around and you see somebody that their knee is hurt. And you pray, and you go over and say, can I pray for that knee? You would have compassion, just as Jesus exercised this gift. When he was out teaching, and a woman whose only son died was going behind him in a, in a funeral... Uh, Just like the sanctified imagination that you drop 
in pictures into our imagination. Lord, that you drop your words into our thoughts. But we know that they're different because it, we would never say that. We wouldn't think that way. And Lord, that they would begin to distinguish your voice from their thoughts, from their voice. And Lord, we bind the enemy from any type of, of, of mockery or any type of deception or confusion. Lord, we cut the enemy's voice. We harsh, we cut it off right now. Because your voice builds up. It leads. It guides. It never condemns. Your word says in Romans, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Recently, I had a friend that tell me, you know, God, God had showed him stuff. You know, he thought God was showing him something. He told me, he said, you know, I don't remember the exact words, but he says, I'm like, well, God told me, oh, you stupid knucklehead. I've been trying to show you this for so much time. And he told me that, and I said, that wasn't God. He goes, yes, it was, you know, because I'm a knucklehead. I'm, and I said, no, that wasn't God, because God's voice would never say that to you. Never would. So we we break off condemna condemnation, words that condemn. We break them off right now, Lord, and we pray for your pure word that you would release it, Lord. I want you to do this right now, Lord, as, as the Lord is activating it. What I want you to do is I want you to say, say this, say, say, Jesus. What do you like to do with me just for fun? What do you like to hang out with me just for fun? Now listen to what he says. Some of you may see it. Some of you may get a picture, but listen to what he tells you. got something. How many of you, he told you something or you saw a picture? Raise your hand if you did it. You can't see because of lights. But... So if you didn't get something right now when I did that, what do you need to do? Practice. Go home and practice when you have your quiet time, when you're reading scripture, when you're sitting down and having a meal and you pray. Say, Lord, can I can, can I see what you see? Can I see what the Father sees? Can I hear you? Can I hear what you're saying over me? Let's do, let's do one more activation, then I'm going to pray and close, and, and I'll turn it back over to Pastor James. Say, Father God, when you see me, what do you see? Will you show me what you what you see when you see me? I'll just wait.
God's word to them, his encouragement to them. He says, when you sit down with a meal, talk about the Lord. When you, on your way going, talk about the Lord. He told the Hebrew people, practice my presence wherever you go, wherever you do. Amen? All right. God bless you. Pastor James.